So guys, this is kind of a, um, a quarantine quick out the blocks. You know, everybody's still in their own bunkers and, and trying to stay safe from COVID and fight the power at the same time. But um, I wanted to get you guys on, particularly you individuals. I know Darren, you and VDOT are starting up an initiative for a proposed pilgrimage of sorts to get top 100 high school athletes, black athletes to attend HBCUs. Can you share with us, um, I mean, as many details as, as you have available right now? Um, we're still in the beginning stages, still trying to map everything out, but uh, we found the, the, the links that has the top 100 athletes, and we just want to use the HBCU platform, the HBCU celebrity, HBCU hub to try to recruit players to come on back to the crib and get some of them dollars back to the people who really care about them and not going to use, you know, use them for generational wealth, as Coach has put it before in his statements, which I think was probably the best thing that's been said these past few days. And, I mean, just think about what it would do for the culture if the top athletes came back to HBCU. It would just – it would change the dollars. It would change the dollars for our funding, for our institutions. And it would give, honestly, I think the black culture and the black dollar a very big uplift. Coach, you want to weigh in on that a little bit? No, I think he hit it on the nail. I did nail on the head, man. Like it's, it's just, you know, it's something that number one, from a historical point of view, we just need to understand that, um, you know, black colleges were here for you when no one else was here for you, um, and we were created as alternative schools because PWIs um, wouldn't allow you on their campuses, and so you probably had to na have the national guard attached to that, and so. I've always been consistent in, in my um, approach to recruits to let them know and inform them of what I just said. And from an educational standpoint of view, like you got to understand that a lot of these arenas are named after individuals who despise their family name and their heritage as well. So right for me, it's all about the proper education. Like I'm not saying anything disrespectful. I ain't saying I'm just giving you the facts, the, the, the true hardcore facts. And so it's time when we are educated properly, I think we can make rational decisions and, and improve people, people's lives that look like us, because that's what it's all about. Now, let me ask you guys this. Um, I have some, somewhat of a limited vocal point because I attended two PWIs, not, you know, because I just didn't want to go to an HBCU, but I was a track and field athlete. What I thought was very, very interesting growing up in High Point, you know, I had 11 track state titles and a basketball state title. I had hundreds of thousands of dollars in scholarship, you know, offers, but I didn't get offered or recruited by an HBCU. And there are a lot in North Carolina. Do you think that sometimes some of these programs, and that's excluding you, Coach Moten, because we know you're like a celebrity. <laughs> but do you think that sometimes these coaches shy away from top recruits because they don't feel like they can compete? Well, I, I, I just think that – I think we have to stop playing the game, right? And so what I mean is I get so many calls from coaches um, or emails from AAU coaches who make that exact statement. And their child or their kid that they're coaching may be like a top 25, 50 athlete. He, he said, well, he went to such and such, but – he would have went here after the kid has already signed, but nobody recruited him. And so my thing is, shoot your shot at us. Let us know you're interested. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? Like, don't, because right now is is we don't have the necessary funding to be flying all across the world following an individual who's really just using us for clout mm -hmm. at that particular time. And it's too risky to take that chance. And just like any relationship, I don't care what it is, a best friend, a parent, a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, it takes two parties to show interest. So yes, if you just initiate the interest and, and you're a top 50 recruit and say, look, I'm being recruited by all these power five schools, but I'm really, really interested in the HBCU. All right, that's our trigger. So now if we don't take that bait, then we're just stupid. You follow what I'm saying? But express the interest on your, on your level too. That's what I would uh, recommend each athlete to kind of do. Yeah. And Don, fans' favorite, um, what has been – I know that you have very, very close relationships with a lot of athletes. I know a lot of people have tried to push you to become an agent because of these special relationships you have. Have you had any, um, I guess, contact with any athletes that were kind of weighing their pros and cons of a Power Five versus an HBCU? 
Yes, especially here around Atlanta, I will say that it's real big on like trying to figure out if they wanted to stay home or if they wanted to go somewhere else. And even if they stayed home, they were comparing like a Georgia State to Clark Atlanta or Morehouse per se experience. Um, But I will say, you know, to piggyback on what Coach just said, I think a lot of times not only do the student athletes not actually mention or say that they are interested in the HBCU. I feel like the coaches at all these high schools and even like an AAU coach or what have you, they're not encouraging the athletes to take a look at them as well. Um, And I think that in building those type of relationships that I typically have with student athletes or along the lines of media for families to reach out to, to kind of like, Hey, can you cover my boy? No, not really. I don't know who he is, you know, like just to establish that type of rapport. I feel like we have to do that same thing with these high school coaches, because a lot of times these high school coaches are funneling, funneling these kids so that they can make sure that they have a job if they decide to level up. And a lot of these coaches, um, that's their incentive. So if they're, if we're, if we're going to talk about this collectively, we've got to talk talk about every angle what what these schools are willing to do and although our schools don't have resources we have to make sure that the people that have access to certain things or are able to do certain things legally are able to reach out and say that they have those things to do so that's why I said early on when I saw this conversation happening on Instagram I was like hey you guys use me because you know, with fans, favorite fan, my demographic, my following does not look like us. It's all middle aged white men, mostly, I would say 80%, and their ages, age range from 30 to 45. Why is that? Because of the type of content that I have, number one. Number two, it's also the schools that I have the closest relationships to. And majority of those men went to school, they're alumni from those schools or what have you. So I've been, you know, repairing like certain relationships that that I've had in our community just because, and I say repairing, I say because they've seen me do what I do and they think it's separate from my support of HBCUs. And I'm repairing that just to say like, y'all don't understand, like I have players that I've sent to HBCUs or been able to um, assist in recruiting for that. So as far as I'm concerned, I feel, I feel it's an easy thing to do. It's, and I say easy and saying that it's easy for us to find each other that are willing to like put the time in to say, hey, let's let's make this happen. Because if we can flip some of these commits, I don't care if it's five. That says a lot going into the next following year and where you'll probably have 10 to 15. And then following that is going to trigger this whole domino effect because it's not going to happen overnight. Right, right. And it's so funny that you int- that you mentioned um, resources because that's what drives a lot of this stuff. Like the, yeah, the yeah. you know, we've been on the, you've seen the visits, you know, where they have the photo shoots. Of course, I'm kind of dating myself because this was, we didn't have all that back in 2001, <laughs> 2002, and I was being recruited. But um, I will say this: having attended NC State, having attended Florida State, I'm much more likely to see. North Carolina Central and North Carolina a and alumni. I mean, y'all are in droves. I travel a lot. I can't, I could probably count on one hand the number of times that I've been through an airport and made a whole trip in another state and came back home and didn't see anybody with Aggie gear on or I didn't see anybody with Eagle gear on. So the alumni support is there. Like, do, what do you suggest, Coach? What do you suggest, Darren? You guys are a lot closer to your schools than I am to my, you know, alma mater and things like that. What do you think can be done to channel these resources and to concentrate these resources to where you can make a huge difference and be attractive to some of these, some of these athletes that are, you know, into the glitz and glam and the, you know, the, the show off part of recruiting? Man, I think like Coach said, you know, we don't have the resources, so we have to raise the resources. Like, that's the only way to win it over. I mean, it's just common sense. If you visit a school like a and and our facilities are okay, but then you visit a Carolina, that's just, that's just a, that's a, that's a no-brainer. You know oh, what I'm yeah. saying? We're, you're comparing uh, a small HBCU platform to the Dean Dome. So you have to come with a little bit more, you know what I'm saying? And, and hopefully the times of what's going on right now can help, help, help that influence come in, but I mean, you got to have the resources to have these kids come play, man. It's, 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 and it has to be a change, a change within them too. Like they have to be like, all right, this is something I can really, I can, right. I can be the, I can be the person to make this and catapult this change. So, like Coach said, a lot of uh, it's only but so much we really can do because I mean, 
and I would say A and T Essentials uh, probably one of the top ten HBCUs, but a lot of HBCUs don't even have the resources that we have. Like you know, it's, like it, it's, it's a tiered. It's definitely yeah. tiered for sure. Yeah, I I probably performed at probably ninety eight percent of all the HBCUs, and there are some that you know it's it's bad. It's real bad. You know so. And you know one of one of the things that le- that makes boosters open their open up their wallets, open up their purses are the coaches. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that if you get some of these coaches that have played at the next level returning to if they went to an HBCU or just you know taking the job you know without the I guess the alumni connection or whatever, I think that that draws a lot of resources as well. You know, um, I'll use A and T for example. Like I said, when I was coming out of school, you know. Spaceman was a coach. I don't know. Do you know Space Coach? You heard of Space Man? I don't. I haven't. And he was um he was a track coach at, at AT for a very long time. Um, was he a big guy? A big guy with dreads? He had lots of dreads, all the way down yeah, to man. the back of his kneecaps. If you ever see the dreads, like you'll it was, it, you know, it was crazy. It's Spaceman. crazy to see a track coach that big. Like that was the most Don't do him. Don't do him. <laughs> big boy. I mean big boy telling people how to run a 100 coach. Big boy. But I'll compare Thanks, like Darren. Stop. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. But in the last few years, you've seen the sprint programs, the sprint programs at AT catapult to top five in the nation. Yeah, shout out like, to They're getting the top recruits in the nation. And I think that part of that is Dwayne Ross. Dwayne mm-hmm. Ross ran at Clemson. He ran on the next level. He was in world championships. He was in the Olympics. And people want to see someone that has been there. It gives it a little bit more credibility. Now, I would say the A&T gets the top sprint recruits over State Carolina, NC State Carolina, Wake Forest, and Duke. Yeah. And, and, I mean, that was really, like, quick. It, it's only been a couple of years. And he's mm-hmm. consistently bringing in top five you know, athletes, they're not committing to the South Carolina Gamecocks. They're not committing to the SEC schools. They ain't even touching the ACC schools. They want to come to Greensboro and learn under his, under his tutelage. So I think that a part of that is keeping our African-American coaches, not keeping them, but having some of them, you know, go back to these HBCUs and, you know, sometimes they're able to use their circles from, from their careers, their post-collegiate careers to come in and bolster some of those efforts. Yeah, it's, it's definitely going to take the HBCU community because each HBCU within itself has its own family. Like, as soon as, you, soon as you say something to an Aggie, oh, man, you alone, oh, man, that's, what's you alone that's what's up. If I meet somebody from Central, somebody from Central. Immediately. immediately, oh, whatever, oh, HBCU, whatever. Love. HBCU love. So that's, oh, that's kind that's, of the, that's kind of the, our network our we would have to use. Mm-hmm. We would have to use. It would have to be like, my uncle played in Savannah State. You got to come to Savannah State. So, you know what I'm saying? That type of stuff. That's, that's, that's the strongest thing about HBCU. We're in our own little hub within the whole world. Yeah, and that's the thing. That hub has to open up. Because I'm not mm-hmm. even going to hold you, man. I was disappointed when I got to Raleigh and it wasn't like Hillman at all, like, period. I thought maybe that was going to be like a little sub-community. No, sir. So no. I, I will say that that not, part- not with the black student government. No, they can't do anything for you. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> I mean, I ain't had no free time on my hands anyway. I was always somewhere running or doing schoolwork somewhere. But, um, man, just talk about just the culture at the HBCUs. Which I just have to live vicariously through you guys. I've actually never even been to GHO. I've just had to watch through social media. And um, just describe, you know, your experiences there. For me, a and saved my life. Um, literally saved my life coming from a small town outside of Fairville. If you don't leave at 18, uh, you trap, you either go to the military or you're working at a restaurant in the golf course. Uh, it opened up my eyes to real, how real families are, how, you know, how, how different mothers act, different fathers act, how people support systems are, how it was a million people just like me that had a messed up story and still decided to go to college and make that choice. Um, even even like even even though they say A and T and Central rivals, I can't even really say that because Central was one of the first schools that ever cut me a check for a homecoming comedy show. So it's 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 deeper than just going to a school. It's way deeper than that. I mean, you meet lifelong friends. I mean, I've never done a comedy show, no matter where in the world, and there haven't been at least one Aggie or somebody from the HBC on my show, not once. Mm. Yeah, for, for me, it's, uh, man, I owe so much to North Carolina Central. Like, it's it's crazy because I was, if if 
you got to walk by faith and not by sight was a person that's me, right? And so I say that story because, you know, I was a highly recruited basketball player coming out and I committed to a, a power five school. Um, and that power five school ended up, the coach ended up calling me on June the 1st or the 2nd and said, if you come here, I just wanted you to know that I'm not going to be able to see you through because I'm going to retire. And I was like, wow. So now I'm in June and I appreciate it and respected him for that. But, you know, back then this was 1992. So you, nobody went prep school and JUCO, like none of that. I, I was already qualified and all that type stuff. So um, the craziest thing, North Carolina Central came in, Greg Jackson, he came and set up my mom's kitchen table. He said, man, I've never recruited you because I didn't think I had the chance to get you. But he was recruiting another kid off my team by the name of uh, Cameron Hunter. He said, man, if you come to North Carolina Central, I'd love to have you. And I signed with North Carolina Central sight unseen, right? I had never seen the university, um, nothing. And my, I just remember looking in my mom's eyes and she said, I just want you out of these projects. You know, I don't want you to stay around here another year because – it's going, you know, it's the same story. Only five kids in, in 40 years went to college where I was from, right? So she was like, I don't want you back here on these streets. So I signed with North Carolina Central, sight unseen. And I just, it was a big story in the paper next the next day. And I just remember saying, God, please let this school, you know, be worth something. So when I went <laughs> out and visited, it was the first time I had ever seen North Carolina Central. And I fell in love with it. And I just knew if I could have a decent career that I could have, longevity where that school could you know like nurture and help me and provide me and, and the principles of manhood in hopes of me becoming the man that i am today and look at you now you got streets named after you oh uh, hey, look man i don't <laughs> even i don't even know if it's after me i think they just trying to hit me with the okie doke on that <laughs> you haven't seen the sign yet <laughs> i say what you haven't seen the actual physical sign yet no i have it's up it's up uh -huh. Let my son tell it. He he think it's after him. So he done said it so much. I was like, Listen, I was that's his story, and he's sticking to it. No doubt Legacy. about it. Legacy. <laughs> so, man, um, speaking about these Power Five schools, Coach, you call some people to task. You said, "Why are these white coaches silent?" Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and, and you, you know what's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the craziest thing I've always said this I mean you know what I'm saying like so in every interview I've ever had at least twice a year I said that it was just the perfect storm I wasn't doing it for shock value or to call anyone out I was just saying like yo like we really need y'all right now and that's, that's the one time I was like I wish that was my coach <laughs> and, and as a leader right I've never done any I've never asked anyone to do anything that I wasn't willing to do myself and so, like, if you go back and look in 2012, uh, the Sandy Hook tragedy in Connecticut, my, my team wore green bracelets um, to show love and support, you know, for those victims and their families during that tumultuous time. Now, none of those victims look like us, but the humanity in us were able to see and sympathize with them, right? So I've done the ALS challenge. I've done the coaches versus cancer challenge. So my thing was, I need all of us, and let's not take ourselves too serious as a coach. Like, okay, whatever, we good coaches, whatever. But we good coaches because we got good basketball players. And 90% of those players are the complexion of George Floyd. So my thing is we're always preaching buy-in as coaches. We're always preaching all in together as coaches. So now that needs to be reciprocated, and we need to show up for these young men the way they've shown up for us and provided a great living for us because none of us should be taking ourselves that serious because we wouldn't even be coaches if they weren't on our campus. So we are who we are because of them. And so I just – there's a level of accountability to it. And, you know, I just felt that if you can go – on social media every day and, and support your program. And I know you guys see what's going on out here. So you can't turn a blind eye because the moment we put out a TikTok dance, y'all have memorized it in less than 24 hours. Right. So keep that same energy and look at these hashtags and look at the same video and give us that same energy that's needed and required. And that's all I was saying. And that's all I've ever been saying. Like I've been saying that since it's weird because the, 
the kids that I coached in middle school said in 2005, they was like, Coach, they just now catching wind of that? I was like, yeah. That's yeah, because I, mean, I, I have heard you say that before, but this was like the perfect timing. Yeah. Like, I think it was, it was just – it was perfectly placed. It was perfectly said. I mean, it, it motivated and catapulted so many other people and inspired people like, you know, you're absolutely right. Why aren't everyone speaking? If, if you've had any type of career that has – any influence of black people you need to speak of. If you made any type of dollars off our off our athletic abilities, off our intelligence, off our sweat of our blood, you you have to say something now. Because if not, you know, we see where you stand. And that's very important right now. Very important. I thank God that I'm able to still be an entre- entrepreneur in my field because I once was a manager at Walgreens. And I don't know if I would have the mental capacity to deal with that with all that's going on right now within that company if I, if I still had that job. Yeah. Right. I, I remember quitting a job after, um, I think it was Philando Castile. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. After he had passed, I was working at, um, I had, it was like a side gig I had in the midst of doing fans, favorite fan, um, it was with a yoga bar studio well-known nationally and everything. And the thing about it was is that seeing that video and then having to report back at work and all of the people that are walking through the door don't look like me and they don't know what I had to mentally process the night before. Yeah, that as soon as I got home, I was just like, okay, yeah, I'm, I, I can't do this. This is my two weeks notice and this is why. And I broke it down for them. And it was one of those things where neither of the managers pulled me in and say, hey, let me talk to you, you know, or let us understand. And I say that because what Coach brought up about these um, coaches learning these TikTok dances and just jumping on what's hot and trendy right now, um, if you don't know what to say or if you know in your heart that you feel a way but you need someone to give you a better understanding of what's happening, then you should have somebody on your staff that does that, whether they're a consultant, because I see a lot of these programs, uh, you know, utilizing athlete brand consultants now, you know, and it's like, where's your diversity consultant? Like where is someone that's a media member that has covered your team? That's a minority that you could pick up the phone and call and say, Hey, this is coach such and such. I need to talk to you because I want to put out a statement, but I want to make sure that I'm connecting my voice with what's happening. Not you better talk about Drew Brees. I'm not you better talk about you definitely got to talk about him and that rinse and repeat apology. No, it's talk so, about it's Drew. Like, <laughs> so it's like in general to, to me, this not only does this point out <laughs> point out who's not saying what in there and we're recognizing their silence. It's like, you're okay with your graphic designer on your or on your creative staff that some of these power five schools have, which is taking your message and putting it on a cute graphic and posting that. And that's it. No video of you physically coming out and saying that you're connecting with your players or, you know, even some coaches lying about talking to each and every last one of their players. Like, why would you do that? You know, we, they, they uh, he we, thought that they weren't going to call him out because he felt like his players calling him out was reflective of the player and not himself. A lot of these coaches hide behind that protection because no, what, what athlete wants to be coachable, disruptive, but Marvin Wilson had time. And even hearing that a lot of the Florida state football players are boycotting this meeting, this team meeting that he has called because if you're going to make that statement and say that you talk to all 70 of your players on one-on-one, you have to be held to task for that. Like why tell that lie? I, I, I didn't understand that. It was so confusing to me. And see, that's, that's where I've been asked, man, I, I, I probably received 200 emails from coaches, D1, D2. Like how do I um, become more sensitive? Uh, to my student athletes that look like George Floyd with that complexion and what are you doing and I'm like if I gotta answer that question then you're probably not qualified like just think about where we're going you follow what I'm saying I'm like so someone was interviewing me the other day and they said so coach what do you say to your team right now and I'm like Honestly, nothing. Because we do this every single day. <laughs> like, so this ain't, we don't do this when someone is murdered across the screen. They think I'm crazy every day because I'm talking about this when, when it's peaches and rainbows outside. 
So they're like, wow, what a coach out here preaching about today. And now they understand. So we always address and attack these topics because one day that ball going to stop bouncing for the ones that I coach. And they got to go out here in this real world where it's really real. And, you know, a lot of times they're going to be the next leaders and coaches and husbands and head of households. And they have to understand that my grandma always told me, you got to be twice as good out here to get half the credit. So when they go out here, no one cares that you could shoot a basketball at North Carolina Central no more. Right? It's real. It's five when you get pulled over, you're going to be a black man that's pulled over, and we have to role play and take you through these events so you're not culturally shocked when the rubber hits the road for you. And that's just what we do with our program every single day as much as we can. And I have another thing about what Coach had to say, though. Let me jump in real quick is that, you know, when, when they try to make that connection now because something tragic has happened, it's like, wh- how did you make that connection when you were in their homes recruiting them? How, like, go back to that moment where you found out that this young man, he, his mom is a single mom because his, his dad died because of X, Y, and Z. You know what I'm saying? Like, these kids come from different backgrounds. And we saw this in the NFL draft where they basically oh, they took it to a whole nother level of sharing these sob stories when it should be a time of celebration for these young men for making it to yeah, this Tom, level. Yeah, he was 12 and years old when father got shot. If your coach <laughs> is not making that connection, then what, like, what are you doing? You need to quit. Don, let me ask y'all this, because usually I'm, like, at the draft, so I don't get to see the broadcast. Has it always been like this, or was it particularly no, this year? No, this no, year, it this was, year, it was this year was bad. I mean, I like saw the graphic. Was like, they were like, no, we're about, to, we're about to show everything bad. And the thing is, is that it was so visibly, a, like, apparent what they were doing, because my eight-year-old son – was watching the draft and he was like, why is it that every black boy has a bad story? And I'm like, a bad story? What are you talking about? Yes. On one, it was like his mother battled drug addiction for 16 years. <laughs> it's like, well, I had one like, about somebody's mama's credit score or something another. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wait a minute. I wish, <laughs> I wish they would do it. Like the first round only had like three positive stories. Man, so. Like legit the, three. Speaking <laughs> on the NFL. Um. Drew Brees was vocal in 2017. And Drew. And he doubled down on it, which was the worst possible timing ever. He could not have possibly had a publicist or a PR person with him when he was doing that Yahoo interview. But what was different is, you know, everybody that kind of shied away and just didn't say anything when, when Cap was kneeling, people are speaking up. So what about the time for what about right now makes players feel more comfortable speaking up as opposed to four years ago when when Colin Kaepernick was was peacefully protesting by taking a knee what has changed do you think I don't know but George Floyd's death seems different there have been hundreds of hashtags I think that the other he's not the first one to be caught you know for his murder to be caught on on camera and and spread across social media for me, I think it was the fact that you physically saw the life drain from this man's face as opposed to it, like a quick bang, bang, shoot, somebody's dead. Like it wasn't, it was very drawn out, very deliberate. And um, even Drew's I, own teammates said something. Of course, they retracted it when he gave his little apology or whatever that was. But what do you think makes it different? I feel I like think, the majority of them are tired. Like they are all like, okay, now that I can better understand what one what what another player was doing and I'm not, you know, everybody's at home right now. Let's talk about that. Everybody's at home right now. So everybody has time. Let's let's go there. That's number one. Number two, I think at this point, a lot of these players have probably already made sure to the, align themselves to sponsorships and companies that align with their brand. So they may feel like there's this protection of their speech to a certain extent where it's not gonna hurt their pockets. Um, I know for one, for me, the response that touched me the most was Malcolm Jenkins. And I know that for a lot of people, and especially in our community, they have called him a sellout because of what was transpiring with Colin Kaepernick and some other things. But Malcolm Jenkins has been consistently speaking out against these um, type of issues. And to, to see him crying, now mind you, he did take his video down, but to see him crying and release that video 
that right there showed me like, okay, you're at your breaking point. Like you're tired of what's happening. You're, you're, you really want people to hear you and your voice and understand that. And to me, that's, that's what I'm seeing now. Now, I think a lot of them do need to kind of come out and make sure that they are all apologizing to Colin because a lot of them did, they took, they took his protest and did their own thing, whether it was the fist, whether it was the locking of the arms, whether it was staying in the locker room during the national anthem. But at this time, everybody is tired and they're done. Like it's, and right now we're, they're just releasing it for the most part. I thought it was interesting that, um, you know, he was pissed about what Drew's comments were as far as kneeling. But if you remember, Malcolm stopped kneeling. So that was, that was a little confusing to me. I mean, I don't doubt his, his, you know, you know, um, yep. his dedication to the cause. I don't doubt that at all. I just think that it was interesting the way that Drew phrased it. He even said that kneeling was an attack on civil rights, which is just absolutely bonkers, considering there's right. nothing in that national anthem for us. Right. Absolutely nothing. Even in the stanzas that people do sing, there's nothing calling us free or proclaiming our freedom because we weren't free when that was written. So I think that's, that was interesting. But um, to see everybody kind of walk back, it reminded me of a situation with my son um, last year in seventh grade. He was, his face was photoshopped onto a slave by one of his so-called friends. Yeah. Oh, During a history lesson on these little, you know, little Chromebooks they get in school. So the principal calls me, she's in tears. She's like, you know, we suspended him. He apologized to Trey, but I told Trey, you do not have to accept the apology. I feel like that's something that's reiterating with all of us. I don't accept Drew Brees' apology. That's how we felt. I don't either, because he meant that. And we're seeing so many corporations do completely tone deaf things, completely racially insensitive things. And honestly, I knew what his apology was going to say before we got it. The only shocker to me is that he let it fester overnight. That's the only shocker to me is that he didn't, it didn't come out hours later. You know, like I a day, you know. He used a stock image. He didn't even use the image with him and his teammates or nothing like that. He used a stock image. He better not hit the chopper style this season. <laughs> That's all I got to say about that. No, seriously. Nah, it's, 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 it's parts of our culture I, that they want to love, but they don't want to just love black people. I honestly right. think he, I think he's gonna have to make a decision whether he's either gonna have to retire or if he plays. It's, I don't think it's gonna be gonna be good for him because because he he definitely disrespected teammates. Um, and you know I'm not in the NFL, but I know it's a brotherhood. But he broke that. He broke that. Yep. You know what I'm saying? So I don't see I don't see his O line, you know, putting their life on the on, on the line for him like that no more. I, and then I see a I see a little bit more aggression on the other side of that line to get to him now because now. You have the ability to hurt this man and in, in the rights of, of, of the game. Right. And and it, there's going to be a lot of players who are going to take that 15-yard penalty to hurt him. And not to mention the chemistry between him and Michael Thomas. Oh, yeah. That's definitely going to take a hit. The only way I can see the Saints kind of rebounding from this with minimal damage is the fact that teams can't meet until camp. So he has about a month and a half. Depending on how long these protests occur, how long people keep, you know, their, their foot on the gas. And that's the only way I think that they can even really kind of come out of that. Is, I think that's going to be hard time. to do. I think it's going to be hard to do in a city like New Orleans. It is. Facts. Epicenter. And it's interesting <laughs> because him and his wife, Brittany, gave millions of dollars. But it's like, okay, you gave this money, but where was your heart? Did you right. give it to appear a certain type of way? Or... Yeah. Ask Drew if he has anybody on, like, his team that looks like us, that assists him with his company or his brand name. You know what I'm saying? Like, like those are the questions that you ask after, yeah, you've handed over a check, but is there anybody that looks like me that can vouch for you as a person? And even if they can, what is their real experience with you? Well, guys, I want to thank all of you for coming. I know everybody has a busy schedule. I know there's so much stuff going on. Darren Brand, thank you so much. Coach Moten, thank you so much. Donna, you, you guys were amazing. Does anybody yeah. have any parting shots? I mean, I know you guys are celebrities, so you don't even have to give people your social media. <laughs> but, you know, that's how we normally close out shows. So, you know, any closing remarks, guys? Um, everybody just try to, you know, for me, it's just tough right now. I can't even be funny. I can't even be myself, so. I mean, I've been trying to find the, the light and, and people asking me to be funny, but it's just it's just not a good time. So, you know, if any, if, for my message for everybody, just try to find something positive through all this mess at least once a day. Yeah. 
I love that. Well, I, I just want to say thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Love your platform. Keep doing what you do, Queen. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Hey, Coach. Hey, Coach, how do you ignore me at every game? How do you, do uh, you hear me? Uh, uh, you hear me <laughs> yeah, I, I, let me tell you something, man. Since we. How do you, how do you ignore me, Coach? Because I really be out there. Because I hate y'all over there, man. Y'all be <laughs> killing us, man. Y'all be, yo, give us some slack, man. We don't deserve all that, man. I'm going hey, hard, hey, though. I be, I be, I be, I be, hard, be like, you know I be like, look down. Look down. You know what? Like, time out. I hate y'all over there, man. I be like, yo, man, play something. to Drown them out. But you know what, man? Like, I got the most respect for y'all, man. Like, it's a, it's a rivalry. But the craziest thing, and I think you mentioned it, it's it, after those two hours, man, it's love. You know what I'm saying? It's love. And we go at each other and talk talk noise to each other, but that's just out of respect, man. But the yeah. love and passion that y'all have for y'all university is nothing but love and respect for that, man, because that's Absolutely. what everyone needs to exhibit all across the world right now. Absolutely, man. I still hate y'all section over there, boy. Y'all Gina, <laughs> <laughs> hey, you should see how they do that. Oh, they they have disrespect. We we own it. We own it. I can only imagine. Yeah, they oh, it's, it's bad. So I can it's only disrespectful over it's there. It's bad. And I and when I tell you he ignores me the entire I'm talking about don't look my way. And I'm talking about at the point where the whole crowd be like, You don't see him up there. I'm like, I'm like, he he no, I don't know how he do it. You got to learn like, how to do it, though. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you just got to learn how to do it. That's my man, though. Look, so you don't got to go home and catch him on wild and out. That's what you know, I want to see. I don't want to see you in no gym. <laughs> I'm on, I'm in the gym. I'll check you out on wild and out. I'll check out one of your stage shows. <laughs> All right, y'all. Okay, All right, guys, appreciate y'all. This podcast will be available on iTunes in about two days. But in the meantime, you guys can check out quickoutthebox.com, quick out the box on Instagram. Just made a Twitter. That's underscore Q O T B ah. underscore everybody be safe. And um, thank you guys. Thanks again. No Much doubt. love. See y'all, all right?